Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here today. So as Nate said, we're going to be talking about AI inputs today. Um, and in order to get everybody on the same page uh, so that we're all clear what we're talking about, I thought it'd be useful to um, have a quick primer on this topic um, of AI inputs. Uh, so Abeba, can you provide us with that? Yes, uh, you can think of AI inputs as uh, large scale, large scale data sets. Uh, and um, large scale data sets are the backbone of AI systems. Uh, you know, a, a lot of the core principles and methods for, you know, deep learning te techniques uh, and, and uh, barrier, various uh, uh, AI systems are not new. They have been around since, you know, the 1980s, 1970s, 1990s. But what really brought AI or what they call the deep learning revolution is the internet, uh, which, uh, which meant that there uh, which means that the availability of uh, uh, large scale data sets. So the emergence of uh, ImageNet, for example, one of the canonical uh, data sets uh, that's been celebrated uh, where first uh, was introduced in 2009. Uh, with, before that, uh, AI researchers had to do hand curation of data sets and data sets were much, much smaller, much smaller scale. But now with uh, internet, you can you can set up your you know uh, your piece of code that can you know auto crawl uh, the internet and gather huge amounts of like millions and billions of data sets from the web, and you can very easily assemble a large amount of data sets easily, and that means now uh, that the, this availability of you know. I say availability with a quotation mark because under that is a lot of uh, a lot of problematic stuff, which I hope we will get to discuss. Uh, so it's this availability of uh, data at at large scale that has enabled uh, huge and more powerful models with you know millions and now billions of parameters uh, uh, to exist, and because because a lot of uh, uh, basically much of the large scale data sets that's been used to train whether it's large language models or whether it's vision systems, because that data set comes from the internet means there are so many uh, issues and challenges with that. As we know, the internet is not uh, a place where, uh, uh, you know, uh, with safety or, or, or equity or, uh, you know, equal representation of everybody, uh, first of all, uh, the internet represents very Western um, European and American um, perspectives on, and, and point of views. Uh, this means that uh, much of the, the current data set we have, and I work with image data sets, usually I audit image data sets. Uh, so any data set, uh, unless it's you know being audited, unless it's evaluated and, and vetted, uh, is guaranteed to encode, you know, societal stereotypes. Is guaranteed to associate certain identities or cultures or concepts with, uh, you know, uh, with again really uh, deeply held negative stereotypes. With the number of uh, image data sets, I myself and my colleagues audit, audited, for example, uh, one of them it was tiny images. Now, now uh, discontinued by MIT. We found, for example, thousands of images of, uh, you know, uh, images labeled with uh, racial, racial slurs. For example, there was thousands of images with the N word associated with uh, uh, dark skinned people. Uh, you also find content that shouldn't be there in in image data sets. You know, illegal content, uh, content I can't even say on camera here, or images of uh, children is common. Uh, uh, we audited also ImageNet, which is one of the most respectable and canonical and most scrutinized and the best quality image data sets we have up to date. Even with that standard, uh, we found, for example, images of uh, uh, you know, uh, images that would be regarded as indecent, you know, upskirt images of women uh, and, and things like that. Um, and another major issue with uh, kind of, you know, collecting or, you know, scraping images from the web and assembling it as, as a data set is uh, consent. So 
most people there is a, it's it's not a culture you people would even laugh at you if you uh, if you talk about do you have consent of for example of people whose Im who, whose images that you are using uh, in a data set it, there is no culture of consent and for most of the time uh, people whose images are in in a data set are not even aware of it uh, so uh, yeah, data sets are really critical. They are the backbone of uh, current AI systems. Uh, it's because of the, avail the availability of these large scale data sets that now we have, uh, you know, powerful and really impressive uh, AI systems. But with with that data set, and especially because they are sourced from the internet, because the internet is the only place where you can, you know, gather huge amounts of data. Uh, there is also so many challenges and problems uh, associated with that. Great, thank you. I'm um, pin on what you um, mentioned too. It's like I, I definitely echo that there has to be consent with utilizing these data sets in a model, um, and then there also has to be the ability for individuals to say that they no longer want their data to be part of this data set, and that becomes really tricky because if I say, okay, yeah, I, I have put um, text out there on the internet through. Twitter, you know, previously. Um, but now I don't want that information to be in a data set. Okay, well, you know, 20 different institutions or more could have already scraped that data, could have it on their local servers, could have created an AI model with it. So it has to be purged, um, not just at like the source, but trickling down to you. So it's, it's really interesting. Um, I just, I loved what you said too about, <laughs> about all the bias. So I wanted to add in this, you know, right to be forgotten as well. Okay, so maybe I can jump in. Hi, everyone. I'm Alek Tarkovsky from Open Future. We've been looking a lot at the use of um, openly licenses photographs of humans um, for face recognition training. It's this case sometimes called the Flickr IBM case. Uh, it's been known for a while, I think. And I think it's a very interesting case, but I think, Anna, you make a good point. These data sets, you know, go back almost a decade by now, you know, the big 100 million data set. By the way, they're fascinating because, you know, in, in the open movement, in the free culture movement, we always wanted reuse, right? This was like the big thing. And we all knew reuse is often not happening. There are all these photographs on Flickr that just sit there with a very permissive license. And suddenly a quarter of them was taken. And from a perspective of reuse, it's a sort of wonderful case, right? You, you, you have major uh, industry-driven and research-driven use. But of course, there's this dark story to it that a lot of these uses are at least controversial and some of them seem outright um, unethical. But, but I think that's the really big challenge that this has happened already. I think the big question is not just whether there's something that can be fixed in those cases, but how moving forward um, data set governance can be improved. And maybe one more thing I want to add that I think it's important to distinguish two things when you know our topic is public comments. So I think there's a this sort of core commons, which is openly licensed content, right? And it's a good question. What happens when that gets used? Uh, by the way, in these cases, it seems like consent doesn't happen. Privacy laws like GDPR in Europe get ignored. Copyright law gets ignored. It's fuzzy whether fair use really works. And it's amazing that it still happens. It's like big research institutions, big corporations doing it. That's for me fascinating, right? It just proves that law is in the end about also norms and social contract. But so that's one case. And I think it's a very different case. You mentioned that basically the internet gets scraped today. And I think we can also think of it as a commons. And in that case, I think really the big question is exceptions like the European text and data mining exception, which I think, you know, was adopted um, three or four years ago. And back then, no one really discussed AI training, as far as I remember. And it almost feels that conversation is outdated because now this exception should be called the like AI training exception. So for me, these are two slightly different scenarios that maybe we want to discuss. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Florence Chi. I direct the Center for Digital Ethics and Policy at Loyola University Chicago. And um, thank you for the invitation to engage with this conversation. I know it's really crucial in 
the history of Creative Commons especially, um, that we are having this conversation and answering these questions in the public interest. And you know, my question coming here is uh, to solicit um, the input of uh, experts in the field. Like, what would you all um, like to see happen in our creative future together with machine learning and AI systems? And we're talking about facial recognition um, in, in a way that it's not just the province of experts anymore. And I know that um, being an educator, my students are really surprised at how much they are of interest to big tech, even if they have only a passing interest themselves. Same thing goes for their families. We're talking about consent. Um, you know, in, in Norwegian law, there's no such thing as passive consent when it comes to sharing photos of, um, of people. And if you have a child in public, for example, uh, that that child needs to consent. And that's something that's very different um, in other jurisdictions. And so as we try to form these global standards, like there's the UNESCO uh, recommendations for AI of ethics of AI, and it is still very much uh, jurisdictional. For example, I live in Illinois, where there's a very, very strong biometric um, privacy laws. And uh, I, I did receive a settlement from Facebook <laughs> for uh, using my biometrics in a, in a Facebook, uh, uh, you know, data collection endeavor, you know, and, and it really is uh, what Abiba was talking about earlier, where um, they're just scooping data and our conversation has surrounded whether or not we can. And there are lots of things, good things that we can do now. But the focus has been too much on whether we can, rather than the ethical perspective, which is whether or not we should. And so trying to um, center that conversation and get in on these points from the beginning, rather than an afterthought, um, is something that I'd like to see more of in the future. Great, thank you. You know, I, you all raised many uh, issues, all of which are related, um, but I think we may as well just sort of dive into the deep end here and talk about, you know, what can we do about these things uh, that you've raised? You know, um, with the, the consent issue, for instance, I think Florence, you wrote a paper a little bit ago on how people don't really read EULAs, except at least in online gaming, you know? And if we can't, you know, how do we get people who are putting their, uh, you know, stuff, their content online, um, how do we let them know that it could be used in these AI data sets? And then Anna, you raised the issue of people being able to retract um, uh, things that they have within these data sets. How, you know, how can we practically, you know, effectuate that? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, as I said, I, I work uh, with data sets, mainly vision data sets and uh, mainly auditing them. With relation to your second point, uh, and, and going back to the, the point you raised, Anna, uh, uh, about, you know, retracting your, if, if your image is in a data set, uh, being able to withdraw it from an image, from, from the data set is a really important one. However, as I mentioned, these data sets are huge, millions and billions. For example, the current data set we are auditing, uh, which is actually, uh, you know, used to, to, to train stable diffusion, which is, you know, the, uh, one of the, uh, uh, the, the recent, the latest uh, uh, image text generation uh, open, open sourced model that, you know, the, the AI community is really uh, uh, raving about. Uh, so we are looking at the data set for that, uh, which is increasing by the day, which is increasing by the minute. So when, when it was first released about a year ago, uh, it was uh, 400 million image and, image and text pairs. But now, last I checked, uh, about uh, a couple of months ago, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, about a couple of months ago, it, it has reached uh, 5 billion uh, image takes pairs. So in order for an individual to be able to 
delve into that data set to identify their images and then to, re to request withdrawal is practically an impossible task, even for the most technically, uh, you know, uh, technically minded person. So this 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 becomes unfeasible. How do we? I don't know how we get around this. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm just putting problems, more problems on top of on top of problems, <laughs> rather than proposing solutions. I think like so there's two solutions that come to mind. Uh, the first of which is when you are doing massive data scrapes, is there needs to be um, some sort of data refresh. So where you are um, required or you have in place a process where if let's say I'm taking all the Flickr data, I scrape Flickr um, and then six months from now, I scrape Flickr again and I uh, remove the previous data set. So basically what that allows me to do is um, if the origin, if the individual has now put it to private, I don't know, I'm thinking out loud and I'm finding holes in my solution as I as I mention it, um, and it's not perfect, you know, um, and it's really hard. But that that might be one way. Um, the other, like even more simple thing, though, is is to like definitely abide by uh, copyright or other licenses mm -hmm. that are. Um, applied to these data sets. So right now, uh, GitHub is getting into trouble. They have active litigation against them, where in where basically it looks like GitHub scraped all of the repos, no matter what the licenses were. And a lot of these repos have licenses that say they are copyright to this particular company. Um, they were scraped nonetheless. And so this professor, Tim Davis, he was able to, you know, generate large chunks of his copyrighted code without attribution. And uh, a co-pilot says, okay, well, you know, uh, it's in your court user of my tool. And if you end up, you know, violating IP laws, it's on you. But without that attribution, it's just like, well, how are those individuals supposed to activate it. So I think one of my um, propositions, uh, ideas is to say that if there is copyrighted material, and this could be things like code or movies or novels, and I've seen data sets created from all of these types of things, um, the closed captioning that some of you may be using is from movie data sets. Uh, in large part, because you have the transcript, and you have the movie as well. Um, but to obey those, like, if a creator has said that this is copyrighted to me, don't use that in a data set. Um, oh, and I should have said, I, I'm a data scientist, um, at Salesforce. Uh, and so like, when I get really excited about data and how do we evaluate models? How do we evaluate bias, um, in, in these models, but then also how can we transparently talk about them? So that's that's sort of my little background that I neglected to to say before jumping in. Great, thank you. Um, so you know, as far as relying on sort of oh, go ahead, Alec. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, I was muted. Uh, can I go ahead? Be because I think it's really interesting what Joanna said, and maybe one thing is worth mentioning. So we started talking about code, right? Earlier we were sort of talking broadly speaking about personal data. And I think this is part of the challenge, right? This category of AI inputs is very broad. For instance, when we look at these cases of face recognition training, we keep in mind that these are very specific data. Now we think they're also uniquely special because these are faces, right? This is this is about people. But we're mindful that some, some for instance, rules that might be required for this kind of data might work differently. But I think it's a, for other kinds, but I think Anna, the, the kind you mentioned is very important and that's creative and it's not just coders, but there start to be signals from artists who are saying, you know, we don't want stable diffusion producing my pictures. Um, it's very interesting, I think. But but for me, I think one question which the co-pilot case will solve in the US jurisdiction is, is it legal? But the interesting, and I'm not a lawyer, maybe that's why more interesting for me is, is the question, should it be legal? Uh, should it be illegal, right? I'm mindful 
that you know so let's say europe enlarges the tdm exceptions right if they are expanded it would be okay to take that code irrespective probably if it's, it's publicly you know available of the copyright license it stops sort of being a question of individual choice but more of a social contract and i don't want to say i'm in favor of that i think what i signaled earlier this conversation is really changing from year to year and maybe even from month to month but i think it will be one day good to have this balancing exercise right and i think it, it really will the weird thing it it, it really might it, it it really pushes against i think a lot of accepted thoughts around the balance in copyright these are really for me at least and i've been thinking about copyright in a non-lawyerly mainly way for a long time really complex ideas that you take these like input from what millions of people rather than thousands the data sets as you say they go in like terabytes um and you try to uh, how do you make sense w what's fairness in these cases right i think the personal data cases are sort of a bit more clear we know where justice is there and where a bias happens more and more right and there's a lot of conversation on this thanks yeah uh yeah important points and uh, uh copyrights and accountability around stable diffusion uh there has been a movement from artists that uh you know stable diffusion is generating art that is very you know like uh you know that's almost stealing from artists and uh, from a preliminary uh, analysis we know that a lot of uh, 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 so this is what makes studying data sets very uh, problematic and complex because uh, because especially with this current one it, it's increasing uh, you know daily but also uh, now uh, the, the basis for uh, stable diffusion as I mentioned called Lion 400 was re when it was released um, about a year ago it had uh, a 4 million uh, image take pairs and it was just one data set now the data set has you know been divided into uh, I checked, I think last last week, it has 89 different variants or different subsections. So it makes it really difficult to, to, to pin down. Uh, and some of those variants are, we know images from from uh, in, is, is stock photos from uh, from artists, from uh, people that actually or organizations, institutions that actually uh, sell these stock photos. Um, and, and using that as a basis for as AI input, as we said it at the start of this uh, discussion, uh, for to train the model uh, to generate output that very much resembles artists' outputs, has become a really uh, you know burning point, especially on social media. That uh, in, uh, definitely in my circle. Uh, and uh, you also raised another important point, Alec, about, you know, given that these data sets are huge now, how do we even say what's fair and what's not? Uh, yes, there is no, you know, straightforward answer to that. But we know for sure, you know, uh, when when these data sets are, uh, you know, uh, generating uh, generating uh, images or or texts, uh, they disproportionately portray, you know, negative stereotypical cultures and understandings of people and communities and groups and cultures at the margins of society. So even though it's difficult to say what's fair or not, one thing that's for sure, one thing that's been shown by robust amounts of research over the last few years is that when these systems you know, uh, fail to function properly, or when these systems, uh, you know, have, uh, you know, harmful impacts, the harm is disproportionately, you know, uh, put onto onto uh, people that are already uh, disfranchised and people that are already uh, uh, marginalized. So I think these are important points as we discuss whether it's it's data rights or whether it's you know accountability or where accountability should go uh, in 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 uh, creating uh, models like stable diffusion and just putting it out there uh, completely open uh, it, yeah it's important to to keep the, the most marginalized in mind um i i wanted to follow up on um anna's point 
on um, the Creative Commons um, licenses and what happens if you change your mind. And so this is like a really um, big sticking point in, in ethics is when you give over permissions, even when you click, I agree, what's the time horizon on, on this agreement, right? If you give your consent at one point because you just want to access Spotify uh, playlists or, or iTunes and, you know, this, this trade-off between um, convenience, expedience, um, and um, your, your data security privacy rights. Um, the, what I like about Creative Commons licenses, so um, an original Flickr user back in the, the startup days, is that the discretion rests with the user or the creator, right? And when you put it out there, it takes on its own life. It can interact without you. We have um, our profiles on social media that interact with others in the network when we're asleep. So these are relatively new things that people need to get their heads around. And when all these data points that are made without our awareness or consent, um, in order to predict and infer about us and our communities, this is where um, the ability to revoke consent might still be very much, uh, this definitely uh, should be on the table still. Um, you know, I wanted to talk about uh, sharing pictures, uh, particularly of uh, loved ones, those who cannot consent. Um, you know, according to UNICEF, parents share an average of 1100 photos of their child before the age of 12. I know personally, um, that's way more <laughs> than, than the average, um, but, but we're talking averages. Uh, so, you know, the, the ability to um, have a say over what you contribute to these data sets, um, you know, play into our collective notions of something like beauty. Right, when we attempt to operationalize what beauty is, certain groups being included, certain groups being excluded, um, that becomes super important for uh, where we're getting our data, uh, what kind, the nature of the inputs. I think this is um, really interesting because to complicate a bit the picture, um, I think you, um, Florence, sort of started with issues of individual consent, but started talking about something which I think is a really hot topic in sort of, um, you know, data justice for in circles, which is collective rights. Um, and I, I hope, Abiba, maybe I can ask you because I remember you made for me this like a while ago really important signal about the issue that when um, when language large language models uh, developed by big companies right sort of build models for different languages it's a big sort of social justice issue um, you know how that happens whether resources go to the language communities but but then I thought it, it kind of got complicated when I noticed that that the bloom uh, community sort of did that and they see it as part of the open source work I I know that their messaging was you know because we are open source and community driven I think they have like 40 natural languages and they're proud of it so so I I'm really curious if you could say a bit more how you see that part of these data sets it's not a copyright issue but I think super relevant yeah yeah definitely uh, uh relevant also uh yes uh I I used to be like a huge advocate for open sourcing uh because you, you know, as 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 a data set auditor, you can't audit something that's not open source. You can't look at something that you don't have access for. And unfortunately, you know, a, a lot of data sets that are inputs for really important models that impact people's lives, like models by Google, such as, you know, or YouTube's algorithms, they are hidden behind proprietary rights. So, uh, and we don't even know what data they use. We don't know where the data comes from. Uh, uh, or you know what's in, what's in the data or anything like that. So you know open sourcing is really important. But now as we see more and more open source data sets and models, 
I have come to see uh, open sourcing as a double-edged sword. Sword, is that the expression? Um, because take stable diffusion, for example, it's uh, the justification for it is that, you know, models shouldn't be, uh, should be accessible to everybody and 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 that they are democratizing uh, uh, data sets in models. But now uh, we have we see that people can generate any any kind of images or or texts about you know ab about other people as about other communities uh, uh, about especially you know minoritized people with with very with great is people can use models for really uh, 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 troubling issues and. Uh, <laughs> which makes uh, uh, which makes it problematic to to even discuss uh, to to discuss the kind of stuff that stable diffusion is currently being used for uh you know to to generate uh, pornographic images pornographic videos uh and and so on so so i i i lost track uh of the original point uh i'm sorry could you repeat it <laughs> Uh, I, yeah. I think I was just interested in, in in exactly what you're saying, but in relation to these language communities, where it also becomes a matter of like collective right to culture. But I also understood your argument is very simple. You know, these languages are sometimes like languages of very poor countries, communities that, for instance, research there on AI is not supported. That's how I read it. But I like, yes, I'm not sure yes, yes. Right. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yes, I'm I'm back on track now. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, you have, uh, uh, for example, you know, communities such as uh, the Masakani NLP, you know, a, a Southern African-based group of researchers that do uh, that collect data on uh, underrepresented uh, languages. Uh, they also build models, you know, for for uh, language uh, machine translation for various. Uh, uh, almost ex extincting extinct languages uh, and, and back to English and, and so forth. Uh, and uh, what we see with that is uh, due to the, the open sourcing movement, um, you know, it's really laborious work to, to gather data on these languages and people that are doing the hard work on the ground of collecting data, annotating them, labeling them and cleaning them. Uh, uh, and then because of the open source movement, as they are open sourced, these data sets are often kind of scooped up by big corporations like Facebook or Google. Uh, and then they are used to, to build like larger, more powerful, faster models. And then they are sold back to those communities themselves. And uh, this is, you know, this is ironic and it just so unjust as well. Uh, yeah, again, I, this this points to the the, the problems uh, of you know the double edged swordness of the uh, open sourcing and uh, how we should think carefully about um, again licensing uh, and and protecting people that are supposed to benefit from from these uh, you know from these data sets from these models themselves and what kind of safeguards we can we can put in place. Uh, these are important questions. Thank you. Um, so Alec, you raised in the chat uh, this idea about better sharing that, you know, traditionally sort of open source was just about getting things out. Um, but can you explain a little bit further what you mean uh, by this? Uh, I, I just had this thought when I was listening to you, Abeba. I, I really think, and not just in this context, you know, the really the idea was if there's a creator who wants to share, he can use a license and share, be it code or photos or games or whatever. And for me, the really big turn was people started saying, what are the, for instance, financial conditions? And I think crowdsourcing is was an extremely important addition. I really like the sort of open version done by the Goteo platform from Spain. And, and I think they, they really addressed a crucial issue. By the way, they don't only talk about money, but they talk about other forms of contribution. And I think it's spot on. So by the way, I recommend looking at Goteo's model. For open yeah, production. I will. I will also add to your recommendation uh, the Maori data sovereignty rights statement, where they are, uh, you know, the, the disability community in the 
1970 the, the 1980s has this motto that nothing about us without us so any anything that any any study anything that that is done for the disabled you know community has to be done by the disabled community for the disabled community so the maori community really embodies that principle so they for example collected over 300 hours of voice data from from uh, you know the elderly maori speakers uh, and you know it's their data they annotated it they cleaned it they labeled it themselves they built the machine translation and other uh, voice assistant models themselves. They also developed this um, data sovereignty uh, statement where they are very clear about how the data can be shared, who is, who can use it, for what purposes, for what lengths of time. So uh, yeah, to, to add to your recommendation, Alec, uh, the, the, the Maori data sovereignty statement also serves as another example that it can actually be done. <laughs> That's an important point about um, including marginalized communities in their own empowerment rather than having um, these initiatives be top down. Um, part of the issues here um, that stand from um, this kind of predatory inclusion that AI systems <laughs> kind of present to to um, communities, it, it makes it our relationship with data extractive right and it um finding ways to prevent that it, it goes beyond ai it, it's really about just uh, human um resources being us also um res with respect to the environment we're talking about what um computer vision can do um it can take the the workload off our hands in a lot of ways the ability to uh, predict from large data sets uh, when and where um, a disaster might happen um, the the relative health of uh, wildlife for example but the <laughs> the problems are they do come up when we're trying to make those same generalizations about humans right <laughs> is this human with this photo um that we have captured here, is it likely, is, is this human likely to get sick? And what's the contextual um, integrity of that specific instance of, of data, right? Like, what are the rights of that person um, to have their, their relative health um, inferred, uh, predicted, used to, uh, for, for other purposes? Um, other than what they initially signed on to have done with that photo. Yeah, and and uh, just just to continue from uh, where you left, Florence, uh, the problem with uh, you know inferring or 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 extrapolating or predicting uh, uh, these models, predicting or or inferring, uh, is that we know they are trained and validated by data that's always problematic unless you know you can as i said at the beginning you can assume that any data you assemble from the internet unless it's like vetted and audited again and again you can assume it will always contain problems so the problem with these predictive models trained on such data set is that they are very likely to 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 carry you know the the downstream impact of the data set that they are trained on um so yeah ju just to add to to this point to uh, to what you said about uh yeah inferring <laughs> and predicting can i comment on, I think... on something oh, sorry go ahead no go ahead <laughs> no, you go first <laughs> i'll wait okay <laughs> cool um one of the really interesting things that I've been noticing too is more and more guardrails against um, rhythms that could be harmful to the end user. So uh, New York, for instance, I think well, there's a law that's coming into play uh, at the beginning of the new year or soon, I'm also not a lawyer, but basically they're requiring AI audits for hiring systems that use AI. And this need for these more and more external audits are 
are really important because if I do have like a health classifier, I'm going to want to make sure that, yeah, the, the data has been picked through with a fine tooth comb, that it is representative, that um, there is a way for that system to be accountable when it does make mistakes because the potential harms are so great for being misclassified. Um, hiring is another one of those. Uh, anything that you know involves like the health and livelihood of an individual is super important sentiment analysis maybe not so much but um you know on an aggregate that too can be really harmful hate speech though way more important you know because people can get um removed from, from sites unnecessarily so yeah that's that's just what i want to uh add in on that go for it alec <laughs> Yeah, sorry. I hope I will switch the topic a bit to, to, to because I found the question in chat interesting, and it's a question with whether um, um, whether we should maintain sort of um, is there a public interest case for maintaining wide access to data? And my answer, I think, again, uh, I participate in these data governance conversations in Europe, and I sometimes feel that we use this generic term data, but for instance, the legislator was actually thinking about some specific data. And it's actually sometimes clear which kind, of, and then they generalize, or sometimes you don't even know. And, and maybe if we had some kind of like, probably impossible to create like typology that we could say, you know, because there are kinds of data which I would really like to have open. For instance, yesterday there was the ODI summit and there was a panel on open data with really strong arguments about climate data, which by the way is held in the hands of private companies. I don't know, there might be some like personal data, community data aspect there that needs to be dealt with, but there's also a huge case, you know, to just make it shared. And I'm saying this on purpose because I think there's so much now conversation and, and rightly so on the challenges that we're, I think, getting into a bit of a cultural shift that sometimes forgets that there is value in open and in solving all sorts of issues like also community empowerment can happen through data right and and I'm, I'm particularly really looking at environmental data, which I don't know a lot about, but this is the case where I see people being really um, optimistic and by the way i think it's a it's a good question for instance for the open or the commons movement how much attention to pay to to fixing the bads and how much to setting good standards um you know maybe we need to create data sets that are you know properly audited, uh, cleaned as much as possible for bias, setting highest standards possible of transparency and audit and being freely shared. Um, but is that more important or is it more important to, you know, deal with the ongoing challenges with really wrong governance? I don't know. <laughs> I, I agree with the, the importance of uh, open. Uh, it's it's really critical. We have to develop a, a culture of open and, and transparent data sets or models. But I think it also has to come with accountability. When you open something up, you open it for all kinds of uses and misuses. So there has to be a mechanisms for accountability in some guidelines have have to be set that that need to come uh, with the open i think so we are at 46 minutes past the hour and we said we'd transition to q a at this point with the audience and said there's been a really active uh, chat today so um i'm gonna try to pull some things from the chat so one question was and this relates to what we were just talking about uh, is um, what constitutes a public commons that can be used as uh, input uh, input for AI? That is, we have just you know open data that can then be used. But if there's problems with just sort of massive, huge data sets made up of random data, how do we manage those things? How do we manage? We already talked about rights. You know, people consenting to have their um, uh, their you know works or whatever included in these things. How do we manage any of this, um, especially? You know, considering what we're talking about, sort of open and open movement. I guess like one thing that I have seen, um, and this is less on like the openly available data sets, although some of them have been open sourced as well, is that organizations or corporations will um, compensate individuals for their time and efforts, whether this is um, auditing and just labeling data which is scraped uh, from the web or the creation of data. So uh, 
for instance, if you have video data and you're wanting to do some um, segmentation or person following to be able to say like where somebody is going in a room, annotate like if they're picking up a cup, things like that. Uh, then you'll have a whole bunch of different actors in various situations doing these various movements. Um, and a model like that, I don't, I don't think this is necessarily the commons, but the thing that is lovely is that the actors understand what the data is being used for. They are active participants in this. Um, they hopefully have the ability to, you know, opt out 10 years down the road or 10 months down the road if they determine that they no longer want to be part of the study. And then um, even more greedily from my perspective, they uh, often some of these data sets opt into having a subgroup uh, demographic information. So they state what their gender is, they state what their ethnicity is, state what their age is. Um, and then I as like, you know, a, a data scientist can see if my resultant model is working equitably for all or at least performant for all. Um, it's not perfect because it of course takes a lot more time and effort <laughs> um, than, than the other methods that have been used, but I I like that method a lot better. It makes me feel more comfortable. Yeah, I'm still having conversations with um, engineers and computer science uh, scientists where um, I say, what if we don't collect that data? <laughs> and then they just laugh at me because, you know, huh, we're in a market. Like, <laughs> you know, if they don't get the, that sweet, sweet data, then someone else will. And it's this, um, <laughs> It's this real kind of race to the bottom that we can't seem to, to get around. So right now we're still at that like ethical guidelines, non-binding recommendations, best practices kind of land where we don't have anything that's enforceable or has teeth because, you know, law is still like everyone else catching up to the movements in big tech. I think this is a really important point that's also been sort of addressed in the chat, so I'll raise this question, um, which is if we think that maybe the laws are sort of inadequate here, Anna, you raised like maybe relying on the courts, but I don't think the courts can do everything here. And Abeba, you mentioned that we should have guidelines and, you know, I think you've done some work on how uh, AI ethics research you know, is outpaced by AI research, by developing things. And Florence, as you said, that there's often sort of a movement to just you know, do it and deal with the consequences later, I think, or something, you know, something like this, or you know, use the data and not worry about it uh, initially. Um, I guess my part of my question is, how do we get people to buy in to, you know, paying attention to these issues, uh, recognize that they are issues? Um, how do we, you know, drive dialogue in this space? And then, you know, again, the sort of question that I keep coming back to is, how do we deal with any of this stuff? It just seems like such an impossibly huge problem that, you know, we have to approach it somehow. We can't just throw our hands in the air and say, well, it's a problem. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, I think, you know, uh, two, three years ago, uh, I, I'm, I'm an academic. So I would, for example, write papers, you know, you point out problems, you audit the data set, you will always find a problem. And then, in you know, it's a traditional academic paper. And then in, in the discussion or in the end, after results, you list a number of like, you know, methods or tools or a, a number of solutions, and then you leave it at that. But now I have that I, I have just realized that's just that's just not enough. Um, you know, you, you can point out the problems with data sets and some people might, you know, put some resources in time to to de to de detoxify it or to even remove it from use or to do something about it. Uh, but there is no obligations. People sometimes they don't, nobody cares. So what I have come to realize is also companies really do not self-regulate. So what I have come to realize, and I'm, I'm moving, trying to understand, trying to familiarize myself with policy and regulation, uh, what I have come to realize is that you know, data set curators, researchers, large corporations really will respond only to regulation. So I know that's just a very general statement and, and the details of it are, you know, 
like another rabbit hole, uh, but I think uh, it's really important to uh, uh, to think more carefully uh, about uh, how 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 to regulate uh, and how to uh, have a clear uh, implication for you know really bad quality data data sets or you know racist uh, models with racist outputs or anything like that. Uh, so we we really have to. Uh, uh, it's important to focus on accountability through through very clear policy and regulation implications. That's my thinking. It, it, it makes me think how, you know, in copyright reform activism circles related also to Creative Commons, there's, I think, for years now been this never ending sinusoid between like, it's about self regulation and voluntary licensing and norms. No, it's about regulation, it's back and forth. Um, and I think you can pick your sides. I find it really interesting that now in this sort of AI regulation debate with the new responsible AI licenses, some people are thinking that they almost interlock with the regulation that you can try to enforce things like in parallel. Um, it, I, I find it very interesting. It seems like you're using all possible tools to attain the same goal, though coming from Europe, I also do have a strong preference, maybe not preference, but that faith that we need regulation for sure. It's more of a problem when regulation passes, it's not good enough, and then, you know, it won't happen for another decade. Maybe that's when you go back to <laughs> voluntary solutions. Lawrence, do you want to talk about that paper a little bit and how it relates to this? I think that's really interesting. Oh, yeah. I just um, pasted a, a link to a paper um, on the ethics of Uber and other, uh, you know, rideshare applications. And... I talk about full costs because it has a lot of the discussion we're having here has a lot of analog with the environmental conversation, right? What what incentive do companies have to be, um, you know, environmentally minded uh, when the quicker solution would just to be, you know, to keep on keeping on? Um, and you know, when you look at the full costs, then that provides a more uh, accountable way of seeing uh, the whole picture, including um, environment, including health and uh, social well-being, rather than just looking at, you know, it's a uh, very um, limited, um, you know, notion of, of profit uh, over people. And if you're looking at the ethical um, standpoint, we definitely want to take into account a broader range of interests and um, well-being. I think the other thing to point out here, and um, yeah, I definitely agree with you, uh, Stephen, that like regulation can't do it all. Um, and one of the unfortunate things, well, it, regulation definitely does help. So it, it does help, you know, advance what we're able to do within corporations in terms of like, you know, pushing more ethical products. Uh, one of the things that like made me that I was thinking about too, though, is that we can't hide between like the behind the fact that um, legally all the boxes are checked. So uh, Meta, you know, released a, a chatbot bot sim a number of months ago, and it was it's just oh super racist. It has all sorts of like factual issues, um, but I I felt like they were hiding behind you know like the terminology for these terms and services saying that it basically it was something to the like of this chatbot is going to potentially say things that are inappropriate you agree to like flag anything that's wrong and oh yeah we're, we're you know it's just an experiment so it don't don't be mad at us basically is the gist that I got um and it just like made me cringe so much because okay Sure, with these terms of services, they likely can't get sued um, because they covered their butts. But, you know, it's, and I'm sure that companies are going to be able to say, oh, yeah, we did an AI audit of our hiring, you know, um, algorithm, and it could still be racist. It could still be biased. It could still be just flat out not useful. Um, yeah. So that's, <laughs> one thing that can be frustrating um and eventually I think we'll get there like I, I like to try to be optimistic but uh it's 
knowing what can still happen is important to acknowledge too. I guess, you know, having these kind of public discussions is also part of changing the culture, part of, you know, progressing and part of getting there uh, because uh, currently the dominant narrative of AI is, you know, revolutionary and, you know, game changing or whatever. So uh, having a discussion about, you know, the underlying issues is the fact that this kind of discussion is part of the discussion of AI is uh, and, and and raising awareness, uh, public awareness, whether it's like within uh, AI researchers or the general public is part of, uh, even though it's like unmeasurable or somewhat amorphous, it's part of the uh, going in the right direction, I think. You know, I think that is a great point to maybe end on, unless anybody wants to add one more thing. We are at 59 minutes. Well, thank you so much uh, for being here and participating in this panel. I had a great time. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed it as well. Uh, and to everybody who's watching, please feel free to join us tomorrow for our conversation on AI outputs. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.